In today's video, we will be demystifying the clothing and accessories you want to have with you to ensure that you and the family can enjoy the outside in winter. So, you want to keep enjoying the backcountry and the outdoors, but you are maybe new to and a little intimidated by winter conditions. Hi everyone, I'm Jason. This is the first in a series of videos on not just surviving, but truly enjoying your cold weather endeavors. And not just with a group of adults, but with your family too. I've done climbs in the three great ranges of Alaska, South America, and the Himalaya. And I taught high altitude mountaineering in the dead of winter in Colorado for many years as well. And believe it or not, the coldest day, not night, but day, I've experienced on a mountain was in February in Colorado at around minus 35 Fahrenheit or about minus 37 Celsius. And through all those experiences adventuring in extreme cold, I've learned what I think are the five biggest issues that have the most impact on making a cold weather backcountry adventure either a success or a suffer fest for you and the family. And that will be the focus of this series. Today we'll be covering clothing and the forthcoming videos will go over good movement practices over snow and ice on mountain practices that really impact comfort and success, the fundamentals of avalanche avoidance and fostering resilience and high morale. As always, you can go to our website at shortguysbetaworks.com for additional information and links to gear lists, itineraries, and all of our other videos, the educational ones like this, as well as the Just for Fun Family Adventure Chronicles too. Okay, so I think issue number one is clothing. You just can't get away with not having pockets of air to create insulation between you and the cold environment. And there are two ways that this can happen through the clothing. That's through the clothing's construction itself, which creates airspace within the garment, think puffy down jacket, or through a combination of clothing layers that create air between those layers. We'll talk about how to manage winter clothing both ways, which will help you find the right gear if you can afford it, or best use multiple layers if you're on a budget. And the description below has links to the clothing items the boys and I use most frequently in winter. Our family likes to make four layers available for our upper and four layers available for our lower bodies in the winter time. That first layer, after any underwear, is a base layer and its main function is to wick moisture away from your skin. If you should break a sweat at any point, and we'll talk more about trying to avoid that in a later video, you don't want your skin to be glazed with sweat that will just freeze when you stop moving. So while you can buy dedicated base layers made of wool or polyester blend fabrics, you could also make do with any leggings, running tights, or athletic cut clothing. The keys are to avoid cotton because cotton holds moisture to your skin rather than pull it away and make sure that it fits tight enough to your skin to actually A, pull that moisture and B, leave room for you to layer above it. And all the same goes for your underwear too, frankly. Layer number two needs to fit loosely enough to not compress against your base layer, but not so loosely that it will get compressed when you put another layer over it. And this is the mid layer. Mid layers are usually made of some kind of fleece. This is because fleece generally breathes really well. So if you are working hard and generating moisture, that can escape through the fabric and not leave you cold and damp. Fleece will also maintain insulating properties even when wet. The downsides are that fleece can be kind of bulky and are not very compressible, but that's a problem when throwing it in a pack and during the winter, the fleece hardly ever comes off your body. Choices here really come down to your activity. If it's a high output activity, like walking up a mountain, as opposed to lower output, such as an easy day at a ski resort, then a grid fleece might be better than a regular fleece. A grid fleece is typically superior in breathability. So if releasing body heat takes precedence over wind blocking comfort, then go with a grid fleece. Otherwise, a standard fleece is probably best. If you aren't gonna go with the outdoor industry standard pieces of equipment, a non-cotton sweatshirt or pullover will do. 
For pants, I like a stretchy fabric soft shell as it will conform to my movements. You could go with a non-cotton sweatpant or a track pant as a budget replacement option. Just make sure that it isn't too tight so as to lose that layer of air between it and your base layer. That brings us to the insulating layer. For tops, that is some kind of puffy jacket, and the major consideration here is down versus synthetic insulation. While there have been advances in down, such as treated hydrophobic down, it is still the case that synthetic insulation will not lose its loft when wet, while down will, and it's the loft that creates the air pockets that creates the insulation to keep you warm. If you are in low humidity, drier climates like Colorado or the super high peaks across the Great Ranges, you will find that down is best because of the superior compressibility and warmth to weight ratios. But in wet climates like the Pacific Northwest or lower peaks that are near the coasts of Alaska and Canada, then synthetic insulation will be best. Compressibility and weight matter with this layer because the insulating jacket could be coming on and off many times over the course of the day and in your pack for much of the day. And the same goes for an insulating layer of pant with regards to down versus synthetic insulation. But now you have to add in the ease of taking the layer on and off. That's why I refuse to buy an outer layer pant, either insulation or shell, that doesn't have a full zip up the side. This is to enable those layer changes without having to take off your boots. And if that seems like a convenience over a functionality or safety issue, now imagine you have crampons or micro spikes on. Does taking off your spikes and boots in the cold sound easier than zipping up a zipper? It's hard to replace this layer with something that most people already have, but you can find lots of pretty inexpensive ski bibs and the like, particularly used, to replace your insulating pan. And that takes us to the fourth layer, shells. These are for inclement weather like rain, sleet, or nuking snow. These need to be fully waterproof and should have a hood. These will also be the least breathable but most wind-resistant clothing items. So they can be used to help maintain heat, not just dryness, if you get into windy environments. Since the shells aren't always on, there's a movement to save pack weight by making really minimal shells that don't, say, have pockets or other supposedly luxury features. But I think pockets are pretty important for keeping my hands warm in a storm or for not making getting grab-and-go items a chore. You could replace a shell jacket with a poncho. For the shell pant, again, I pretty well demand a full side zip. These are maybe the most awkward item to replace, but I have seen full-length ponchos and even some how-to videos on do-it-yourself garbage bag pants. The other things you need to think about are gloves, hats, face coverings, sunglasses, and socks and footwear. For gloves, layering up a liner glove with a waterproof mitten is generally the warmest option. Mittens keep your fingers close together without much fabric between them so that they can help heat each other. And while the liner glove reduces some of that benefit, a thin glove won't do much to reduce it and it will add a whole lot of help when you need to take your hand out of the mitten to manipulate something, which happens a lot. If your base layer or fleece has a hood, then you probably don't need to bring a winter hat. But if your hood is on your insulating jacket, then because you don't have that jacket on all the time, you should probably have some kind of beanie. Sometimes your face is going to get cold too. A lot of jackets zip up to cover the mouth and nose, sending your warm expelled breath back at you to help keep your face warm. But that can also make your jacket freeze. Since almost everyone now owns a mask, you can use that as a heat exchanger. Bringing cold air in through a membrane of any sort can help warm that air up to 10 degrees before it enters your lungs. This will help reduce that cold exchange, and it also is a pretty big deal in helping reduce coughing for anyone with asthma. When you're not using it, just stick it in a pocket and it won't freeze like your jacket collar will. If you've got snow, then wear sunglasses. I did a whole video on the damage UV can do from bouncing off the snow below you. It's like doing your whole hike in a reflecting dish. So think protection from the sun is actually being more important, not less. And then your feet. 
You can go fancy like these Polar Tech socks from Lorpen, or you can go simple wool socks. I would recommend a light liner sock with a wool sock as an over, and that combination comes in many budget options too. It's the same concept as the base layer for the rest of your clothes, a moisture wicking layer followed by an insulating layer. For footwear, if you have snow, you should probably have boots. Their height will help keep the snow out of your shoes. That snow melts, making your socks wet and less insulating, so you get into the vicious cycle of cold once you get snow in your shoes. I did a review of the Kamek Snowbuster 1, an affordable kid's snow boot, and there's seemingly infinite number of snow boots available for adults. I would say that a Gore-Tex lining would be a good thing if you get a lot of snow. But if you don't get a lot of snow where you are, you can actually create a temporary waterproof barrier and avoid buying a Gore-Tex boot by either buying or making a vapor barrier sock. This is just a non-breathable layer to keep the heat in. A truly budget person can be made from a bread or oven bag. You wear it over your liner sock. Just make sure to gather all of the bunching so that it's up around the tops of your feet and ankle so you don't get blisters on the bottom and sides of your foot. So that's major winter issue number one, having the right clothing. Hopefully you now know what you need, or just maybe how to make what you need if you aren't ready to dive in with full gear purchases. Have you got any favorite do-it-yourself winter gear recipes? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for coming all the way to the end of this one, and since you got this far, you could really help me out by hitting that like button. It helps spread the channel to new audiences. And if you want more of this kind of content, please subscribe and ring that bell. See you next week as we get into the fundamentals of movement over winter ground and keep on getting more out of that big outside.